Let's take a look at a string of addressable resin blob LEDs. These probably contain WS2812B chips, the ones that you can send data to. And the person who sent me these, Andy, said that when he got them, they ran for about five minutes and then just stopped working and never worked again after that. Unfortunately, when I plugged them in when they arrived, they, they worked. So let me show you some of the effects. If I zoom down this, get them nice and central, maybe even focus down onto them. Then when you click the button here, it goes through various modes, including chasing color. Oh, that's uh, quite fierce. Off. Uh, filling out one color, filling out another color. Just, you know, the standard things, but you've got a fixed sequence of effects, right? Watch your eyes. The light is coming back. The light is back. I shall zoom back out for this. So a couple of things could have affected that. It could have been that there's just a bad connection where the copper wire terminates into here. Or it could be the processor just decided to lock up. That can sometimes happen if the firmware has a, a glitch in it and uh, it reacts to something. There's also an infrared sensor in here, which may mean it was getting a, a rogue signal from somewhere else. Who knows? Maybe even another remote control put it into a different mode. There is one other possibility. With these copper strings, they tend to cut them to length. Just trying to get the, the tie off here. And the very last LEDs, there it is there. No, they've cut it flush because sometimes the little wire ends can just touch each other and short out. So tell you what, now we've seen that it works because I've not been able to, I've been wiggling it, trying to make it stop working and it didn't. But let's open it up. So I shall zoom down a little bit and we'll spudge this open. I'll take the circuit board out and we can reverse engineer it. It will all be done in software. Is this glued together or is this just clipped together? Ooh, I have a sneaky feeling it's glued as well as being clipped. That would be annoying. Mmm, it is put tightly together. It just made crunching noises and is kind of opening. Let's see if we can snap the circuit board. So, this is where I'd normally give warnings about loud crunching popping noises because it used to drive the microphone gain to pot and it used to basically try and compensate and it couldn't and there'd be a real loud click noise. I don't know if it does that anymore. We'll find out when I watch this video back. Oh, this is not coming apart easily. Tell you what, I shall open it, uh, take a picture of the circuit board and we'll reverse engineer it and see what the circuitry is like. I'll also explain how these LEDs work and how you can just control so many individual LEDs with just three wires. One moment please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. And as you can see from this display, it is just using standard WS2812B LEDs. You can see all the patterns that happen on it, including the set of the, the stroby ones and stripy patterns that are being scrolled along the LEDs. Hideous. But yes, functional. Anyway, I shall unplug that now. There are some oddities to the circuitry. Well, there's one main oddity to the circuitry. And it's using two microcontrollers. I'm not really surprised because WS2812B LEDs are notoriously quite tricky to drive, but clever. Let me show you the circuit board first. Make sure I'm focused down on it here. Here's processor one. Now, the function, the work is divided into two processors because this one is dealing with the timing. I thought the crystal, because the... WS2812B addressable LEDs are quite timing critical. I thought this crystal was going to be for this chip, but it's not. It is for this, and I'm going to guess it's a 32.768 kilohertz crystal, and it's for some time function. I don't know if this has a time function. The remote control would have that feature. I'm guessing that's also what there's a little LED for. I've not seen the LED light. Maybe when it's in time mode, it basically it just flashes that LED or lights it to show that it is in, in timer mode. So... The supply comes in, and we've got a capacitor across it, but we've also got a 150 ohm resistor across the supply rails to pose a constant load of about 38 milliamps. Well, this will pose 33 milliamps, and the rest of the circuitry is about 5 milliamps, plus whatever the LEDs are drawing in standby. And the only reason I can think they've added this resistor down here is as a packer to keep a power bank awake. 
There is a decoupling resistor and capacitor for a power supply for the infrared receiver, the microcontroller one and microcontroller two. Sorry about these white. I attempted to put white dots on the tip X so you could see the pads underneath and it skewed the colours slightly. Um, we have the data coming in from the infrared receiver. It demodulates it and goes to this chip. We've got the two crystal connections to this chip with the decoupling capacitors or load capacitors in the case of a crystal. Uh, we've got the switch input and we've got data going out to this chip. And this chip is only effectively using two pins. Data in from this chip and then output data to the LEDs. After that, we've got the connections on the other side, plus 5 volt, 0 volt and data. And we've got them echoed on this side. Anything else worth mentioning on this circuit board? Nothing really. Okay, let's move on to the schematic. And I'll explain how the WS2812 LEDs work. They're very clever, but annoying. Because they're so demanding of data. 800 kilobits a second, and if you pause for a moment, it's over. It's just going to dump whatever you'd already sent out goes out to LEDs. So here's the USB connector, and uh, this is the 5 volt reel, which goes straight through to the LED output, and the 0 volt reel, the negative in the USB, also goes straight out to there. There is the mysterious load resistor, which puts that load of 33 milliamps on the supply all the time, and a little decoupling capacitor. There is the other decoupling capacitor with its... Uh, Resistor here, which just provides a slight buffer, provides a stable supply for the infrared receiver, microcontroller 1 and microcontroller 2. Oddly, microcontroller 1 drives a green LED, but it does it from the plus 5 volt rail instead of this rail. Even though it's a 10k resistor, which is huge, it's just going to be very, very dim indeed. There's a button for changing modes, and I shall add that. Oh, just added a dot to my finger. Uh, that one is used to change modes manually. And um, there's the crystal with its two load capacitors down here. And there is the data line going to the microcontroller, the second one that controls the output to the ws 212 BLEDs. And the reason for this, I'm guessing, really, it just needs uninterrupted processing time to be able to hammer that data out to those. It's also got one pin tied to the 0 volt rail, which coincidentally tallies up with the PIC microcontroller, PIC 12F629 and others, with their master clear pin which uh, because of the way it's configured inside because it's also used for programming voltage you can't just tie it high or low easily um, so it's, it's often tied to either pos positive or negative the output then goes to the leds and the leds are just connected above across the 5 volt and 0 volt rail in a big line and the data loops from one to the next to the next but it is broken through the leds now the way these work is that the data coming in to the first LED at the start of the stream does not pass through to the second LED. What happens is as soon as the LED detects that data is being received, it takes the first three bytes, red, green and blue, and then it transfers the data in, buffers it and sends it through to the next LED, which is good because you can have huge runs without the risk of uh, data getting garbled by picking up stray interference. The second LED then takes the next three bytes because it's it effectively only sees the, the second three bytes. It didn't see the first three bytes. So it sees the second three bytes and it takes them red, green, blue, and then it passes them through to the next LED, which takes the next three bytes. And that keeps going all the way along. Now, these aren't looking at any more of the RGB data anymore, but they are looking for a break in the data. So what's actually happening, instead of just ones and zeros for that data going out, uh, it's a positive to negative transition. So for a zero, it will be a brief positive transition and mostly negative. For a one, it will be a, a longer positive transition and then a short negative transition. And then for the latch, it just pulls it low continually. So when these have taken their three bytes of data, they put it. They don't put it straight out to the LEDs. They put it out to a little buffer that holds it there. And then once that goes low, all the LEDs see that happening at once and that's when they transfer their data out. And that is the curse of WS2812B LEDs because if you're trying to be clever and basically process data in real time and send a byte out and process data real time, as soon as you don't make it in that time scale of that uh, latching uh, low transition, or if you go too long, if you're keeping it positive, then it basically will start misinterpreting it as data and actually put rogue colours in. But if you 
pause for a moment. It basically, if you, supposing you'd only put three LED data out and you just paused briefly before the fourth LED, they'd say, oh, end of data. And they just go, and they just put it straight out at that point. And you'd, if your code is not working, you'll just see the first LEDs. It'll only affect a number of LEDs until your processing time is too big. That's why they've used a separate microcontroller just purely for these LEDs. It's pretty interesting. But that is it. So I don't know if there's anything wrong with this. I didn't see anything wrong with it. Maybe there was a bad connection. Maybe something shorted out somewhere. I don't know. But uh, as received, it appears to be working. It's now held together with a cable tie. And it is putting out standard WS2812B LED control or WS2811 if you've got those pixels. So theoretically, you could use this to drive the waterproof pixels. Um, just any random sort of pixel string, including... Hold on. Just random rolls of LED tape. So you could have the colours chasing along. But there we have it. Uh, it was worth looking at this purely to explore the way they've divided it into two processors. One for timing, for the, the clock timing, you know, maybe shut off at night and on again in the morning. Uh, and also for controlling the patterns that are selected and uh, the infrared receiving, which are all processor demanding. Um, and because those are processor intensive, it's just basically, I would guess that what Microcontroller 2 is doing is it's sending the data out, but every time it does the latch thing and it pauses the data out to the LEDs, because you can pause as long as you want, I think. Um, but when it's doing that, it's probably saying to that Microcontroller, so that might be bidirectional communication, but it's saying to that Microcontroller, right, is there any new information? And this microcontroller will then send, you know, oh, this is the pattern that I want right now and the speed I want right now and intensity. And it will send the data across and then this will do all the processing of the next frame and then just hammer it out to the LEDs. But there we have it. Interesting. Very interesting LEDs indeed. They're everywhere. And uh, they're a good, useful type of thing in such a simple addressing system as well. It's very, very clever.